series of videos, the Seamaster Chronicles, we will explain to you how a watch that sprouted from the watches that Omega delivered to the Royal Air Force during World War II has become so much more. The very first Seamaster was introduced by Omega in 1948. It has grown to become a collection, a large collection in fact, in which you can find not one iconic watch or two iconic watches, but a host of iconic watches. I think most people know someone who has inherited a Seamaster from their father or grandfather. That could be either an elegant dress watch from the 1960s or a big and rugged professional dive watch. This year, 2018, Omega is celebrating the 70th anniversary of the Seamaster and also the 25th anniversary of the Seamaster Diver 300 meters, which is also known as the James Bond watch. In this first video of the Seamaster Chronicles, we'll be talking to Omega's museum director, Petros Protopapas, about the history of this legendary watch. This is actually quite a long story and it all starts uh, in the tough years of the Second World War where Omega was uh, delivering massive amount of watches to the Allied forces and more specifically to the Ministry of Defense or at that time as it was called the Ministry of War in the United Kingdom or England. Obviously the military timepieces that were worn or were supposed to be worn by Air Force pilots, naval force infantry and naval officers, they had to be uh, waterproof or whatever people meant at that time with waterproof. Uh, they had to be slightly amagnetic, again whatever people understood at the time as a magnetic. We had to invent all kinds of technologies, we have to introduce them or we have to just better on certain other technologies like sealing technologies. In that case, the military timepieces had seals or joints made out of lead, for example. It was this technology that we produced in staggering quantities for wartime use that sort of gave us the technology we needed to, after the war, as soon as the peaceful times uh, came upon humanity, if you want, and upon Switzerland, to be able to introduce commercially the watch at such a high level. High level means like directly upon its introduction, the Seamaster in 1948, which was following up on all these wartime technologies, received a commercial debut of huge numbers. And not a single company could have done it so quickly after the war. So that the technology was war tested, if you want, but it was commercialized as a child of peace. So this is a bit the, the wartime birth story of the Seamaster. The very first Seamasters of 1948 were docile looking watches. They were incredibly robust. They featured for the first time a rubber gasket, but still in design, the watches were great looking, dressy, sportsman watches. So the Seamaster, until roughly 1957, remains a dress watch with great technology and a robust dress watch uh, with its insides really hidden. So the great technology is hidden. Now by 1957 you have a severe cut in Omega's model policy because in 1957 you have the arrival of what we refer to as the trilogy. And the trilogy brought the so-called professional line of watches into Omega. In 1957 within this trilogy the world saw the introduction of the Seamaster 300, the Railmaster and the Speedmaster. All three are legendary watches and their stories are quite known because in fact the Seamaster 300 was very special. Uh, technologically wise the watch was extremely extremely well designed and today one might be forgiven to say it was almost over engineered uh, but in a good sense and still the watch doesn't show it. You see a revolving bezel which is a first for a Seamaster so it's a very professional watch. You see all the attributes of a professional watch, dark dial, luminous, contrasty readouts, big hands, everything you would need to survive also underwater because this one was meant to literally be worn underwater. But you have some facts that not too many people know. For example, with other period diving watches, famous or not famous, you have the crystal, Hazelat crystal, being uh, mounted from the top. Now the 2913, the CK2913, the Seamaster 300, the first generation, has a very special crystal. It's still made of hazelite, but the crystal has an inner flat rim. And in fact, you have to insert the crystal from the inside of the case back, so it stops before it's getting out, and then the ring that you screw in from the back, which means that the glass, the crystal, is not actually secured by pressure, 
as with every other dive watch at the time, it's actually screwed in. What does it mean? It means that without us, Omega, saying it to everybody, we've created with the Seamata 300 not only a pressure-proof watch, but a vacuum-proof watch. Had, by 1957, saturation diving been a normality, had people been, would people dive using saturation techniques and needing decompression times, breathing helium and all these things, this watch would have been perfect because this would be the only watch in the market, and I mean it, the only watch in the market where the crystal wouldn't pop during decompression time, and this without any helium valve. So the CK2913 is an incredibly important design step towards uh, the professional diving watches that came in the 1960s. So this is something that I literally think is, is, is an, almost an undervalued part of the Seamata 300 history. The introduction of the trilogy made two things at Omega. First of all, yes, as you've heard before, it made sure that we are now, as a company, um, having our own professional line of watches out there and almost over-engineered professional line of watches. At the same time, it made sure that the Seamaster starts to look different. People talk about design when they speak and they see, when they think of a Seamaster. Now, design means two things. It means also recognizability and it means technology, it means colors, it means everything. In terms of recognizability, you suddenly have two things. You have two faces of a Seamaster. You have a professional face and you have still the continuation of a dressy Seamaster. For people to understand this, Omega had to make a, a clear cut in the line. And to exemplify this cut and to, to make it understandable to the, to the markets, we kept Seamaster for the professional line and we sort of indicated, well, on the dial of some watches, starting late 1962, that the dressy sportsman's uh, or just sports watches in the Seamaster line are meant to be for the city. So they were called the Seamaster Deville models. And the for the city um, family was a huge success as well. So Omega decided in 1967 to give it its own family. So the Deville separates from the Seamaster and becomes its own family. And the dressy Seamasters, they go on, they be developed, they live on up until today. By 1968, the company Omega was working together with a French diving specialist company, Comex, uh, to develop watches that were suited or best suited for professional diving, deep sea diving and saturation diving. Omega was involved in a huge research project to create literally the world's best professional diving watch tool or tool watch. And by 1968, Omega has developed two kinds of prototypes for the same job. There was one model that was called Ploplof Zero and one that was internally referred to as Ploplof One. And funnily enough, these two Ploplofs, they became commercial models. One became the Ploplof as we know it today, which debuted yeah, roughly like late 71, beginning or mid 72 in the markets. And then the other one became the Seamaster 1000, with the famous oval case. Both models, they follow one doctrine. And this doctrine is, don't you let helium enter the watch in the first place. If you don't let helium enter the watch in the first place, then you don't need to offer helium or any other gas an escape route. Obviously, a professional diver would want to have a watch that has as many, as less holes as possible. A few holes you cannot avoid, but some holes you can avoid. So you could also avoid with the Ploprof and the Seamaster 1000. You could avoid the extra hole of the helium escape route. Not to say this is not a valid route, but trying to develop a watch that does not need a helium escape valve was Omega's biggest priority. I'm showing you literally a prototype of a Seamaster 1000, but this was called the Ploprof Zero. This was developed a few months before what today we know as the Ploprof. The Ploprof internally was referred to as the Ploprof 1. In any case, there is one more thing that I want to, to divulge and to discuss here. It's the metallurgy. And one of the things that we have in our archives that came as a, as a specification remark 
from the French side of things, from comics, was please pay attention. This is the environment in which our divers will dive. So chemical reactions are a daily business. So this is a daily risk. So you have to try to build a watch with a metal that is less prone to these reactions. Now, where could we look at Omega better than to our diving friends back then? And our diving friends at Comics, they used a certain steel alloy for their diving bell. If you look at press materials at the time, the diving bell, as quoted by Comics, was built by a certain steel alloy that was called at the time Uranus or Uranus steel. And if you look up Uranus steel, you will find that today this steel belongs to the steel alloy variant that today is referred to as 904 steel. Now this is very important because Uranus steel was the very first alloy that was commercialized by a French company, by the way, and this is the only steel available, maybe at the time, that was resistant enough to exactly this kind of chemical reactions. So we were super far-sighted to want to use a new material. We even tried, Omega even tried back then to use titanium for the Plop of Zero and Plop of One prototypes. But for various reasons, and because Uranus steel is even better for this, we machined the first cases in Uranus steel. And when the Ploprof was commercialized, as I said, end 71, mid 72-ish, every single Ploprof that was commercialized and put in the market until the very last piece left the factory was in Uranus steel, or was, if you want, in today's speak, in today's parleur, in 904 steel, which is literally a, a, another transliteration of our pioneering spirit. This is very, very important. Another thing that we have to take into account is that the Ploprof, as tested for comics and internally, was proven to go as far down or have the possibility to go over a thousand meters. Now you have to imagine this. We talk about 1968 to 1970 here in commercial production. So this is a watch that is way beyond any of its possible expectations. The Ploprof came to the market, was a huge success, and was followed in the mid-70s by it was actually the first part to be developed, the Seamaster 1000, which finally gave the official guarantee mark of the 1000 meters. Both watches follow this technology, both watches are helium proof and are a remarkable feat of uh, technology and are a remarkable way to showcase the pioneering spirit of a brand. After this, you have an influx of other new technologies that are coming to the Seamaster line, most notably also the quartz technology, and you have both professional diving watches using quartz, or even earlier on, even tuning fork movements. And you have also the quartz technology and tuning fork technology uh, electronics basically being used in the dress side of Seamaster. And then you have the 1990s, where after many, many decades of, I would say, a fierce battle within the industry and within the country and possibly even worldwide to assure that watches can even stay alive, uh, like the aftermath of the Quartz Crisis, um, there was a Seamaster again that was a sign, not only sign at Omega that we can do it, uh, it was a sign of Omega for the whole industry that the whole industry can do it when the Seamaster Professional 300M, the professional diver, was introduced into the market with the blue dial and the waves on the dial, famously or made famous by, well, James Bond in Goldeneye. So again, you have the professional side of things sort of showing the way. And again, you have the Seamaster signaling a new era. And the rest is basically, the, the rest of the story is quite, quite known today because this brings on the new Ploprof, I mean, and it brings on the planet ocean. Planet ocean of today is the addition, is the sum of everything that is Seamaster, uh, historically at least. You have technology, you have an incredible depth rating, you have legibility, you have design because of the colorful play, but the colorful play is not just design, it's made to guide your eyes. So a diver needs a guiding help to see exactly what he needs. So if you need to time your decompression pause, you need on your bezel the 15 minute pause. So the colorful caoutchouc we have in the inserts of the planet oceans of today is exactly this. It's design, not for design's sake, but design for the sake of the user. And this has actually been the creator of the Seamaster line all along.